On the 31st of December 2019, the World Health Organization was informed of a cluster of pneumonia cases in Wuhan, China. In the months that followed, the disease that came to be known as COVID-19 swept the globe, leading to widespread illness and fatalities. On the 16th of March 2020, the UK government advised everyone to cease non-essential travel and contact with others. The University of Edinburgh's Royal Dick School of Veterinary Studies had to respond to the crisis while maintaining essential operations in research, clinical practice and veterinary training. We're uh, a large veterinary school. We're one of the largest in the UK. Uh, we have about a thousand students, undergraduate students on the campus studying veterinary medicine. Uh, we also have a large number of researchers, probably four to six hundred research researchers in the research building. And we also have a large uh, clinical team ranging from small animal, equine and farm animal. So it's a big operation. March was the date that we knew the country was going in, into lockdown. Um, we had anticipated that was coming. I think when the sort of news was evolving in January of, of that year, uh, it became clear that things were becoming serious. And in February, we were already planning that we were probably going to go into some sort of lockdown situation. So it was no surprise to me when the government announced that. I think my overriding memory back to then was when we were told that this was, if you remember, we were told it was for three weeks. I did find that a little bit amusing at the time. Did I believe it last two years? Maybe not, but it was obvious it was going to last a long time. It, this wasn't something that was going away. So overwhelming first priorities with health and safety of the students and health and safety of the staff, how we were going to protect everybody. So we needed a coordinated effort to think about how we were going to uh, have a robust approach to health and safety for the campus, how we were going to manage the logistics of teaching and how we may repatriate um, staff and students from all across the globe. Before lockdown, I'd already organised um, the, the COVID response team from the school, uh, which, which we, we, we uh, jokingly called gerbil in, in alignment with COBRA. Um, and, and so even before lockdown, we were meeting on a regular basis to look at our approach. We were already looking at how we were going to move everything online for the students. And of course, when the news broke, we just had to make sure we had all the communications correct and how we were going to communicate that. In terms of when we first went into lockdown, um, there was obvious anxiety because we knew this was likely to happen. But I think that very soon we moved into that situation where you have a problem to solve you have a, a and that becomes a challenge to try and solve the, the problem. As a health and safety manager um, I was aware that the campus couldn't fully close like some places in the university. Um, I know we have the animal hospitals and for animal welfare reasons we obviously couldn't close these fully. Um, I knew there was um, research going on which would be classed as essential research and I know we have farms again the animals we couldn't just close the doors like some organisations and start working from home. Initially, we had to start thinking about how we were going to be able to continue to provide the support that we do to the essential research that was going on. Obviously, the animal hospitals, the clinics, they were going to continue. So how could we support those functions while obviously maintaining our own safety? We knew from our colleagues in the NHS, we're a college of medicine and veterinary medicine, that um, that cases were on the rise and the hospitals were becoming full uh, and the situation was becoming serious. And we were also having conversations with the NHS and colleagues at that time about what role we could play as a school in supporting Scotland's approach to the pandemic. So we had started to review how we would wind down our hospital um, particularly the small animal hospital um, at the beginning of March because we thought, apart from anything else, most of our equipment might end up being used for humans in the pandemic. We have expertise in epidemiology, infectious disease, informatics that we could support, um, you know, the information gathering. But on a more practical uh, uh, level, there were a couple of areas that we were exploring, one which we definitely did do, which was uh, machinery for the NHS. We gave oxygen and oxygen cylinders. Um, we gave ventilators, infusion pumps, 
right down to scrubs and masks uh, and even um, surgical scrub solution. And one of my favorite moments of the of the whole experience was getting a picture from ICU in Glasgow of one of my great friends in a scrub top which said student vet on it. We really felt that we were, we were doing something uh, to help the, the, the effort that was going on. For me, the first few weeks of lockdown were very, very frightening. I had staff who had to be in. Under the Royal College guidelines, uh, we had to um, see emergencies, um, and, and it was emergencies only. What we did was we divided the, the whole of the staff into three teams, three bubbles. Um, it was basically four days on, four days working from home, four days off. And that allowed us to um, keep those three bubbles completely separate from each other. The equine uh, vets who drive around in cars carried on driving around in cars to see emergencies only. And the farm, because they're part of the food chain, the farm animal vets continued to work essentially as normal. We always maintained an emergency response. So we were able to you know, go and see a horse with a significant injury or a significant disease. But some of the more routine things like vaccinations, for example, and routine care, routine dental care, for example, were postponed. I remember the first, I do remember the first day I came in and driving along the bypass and I was the only car in the bypass and it was during the day. You walked through uh, buildings and they echoed. It was just quiet, just silence. And it's usually got a good buzz about it. Lots of lots of noise and laughter going on. So it was very strange. I used to drive around with this letter in my car in case I get got stopped by the police. And and that's just reflecting that. You think how odd that sounds now, but that was a sign of the times. So I had my essential worker letter in the car in common with lots of other people. Walking in the building the day after I'd locked down and suddenly we'd gone from this bustling hospital to you couldn't see anybody there's no one in reception normally receptions for the 40 or 50 people there's no one behind the reception desks there's just me in the office space that was very strange priorities for the institute with regards to the research i mean the first one was get people an experiment shut down safely and that includes all the experiments to do with animals and ensuring that our facilities would cope with the the reduction of staff and and um, would be maintained. People did change their sort of work practice. Rather than spending hours in the lab, they spent hours writing up that paper or writing. The... So we actually saw an increase in our visible output through publication, scientific publications. We had a number of virologists, in particular virologists, on campus working on COVID-related projects um, as, as early as we could do. Some of our mathematicians who work on modeling pivoted from working on tuberculosis in cattle to uh, uh, COVID in human. And the, the next part to do with research was to try and allow people to pivot to home working. We are very fortunate because we have our own digital education unit embedded within the school. So we have colleagues locally who, who we know and who are expert in online learning. We have a lot of postgraduate taught programmes that are taught online. So we had quite a lot of expertise locally um, that we were able to um, utilise in order to get our, all our materials moved online um, at the flick of a switch almost. We were actually quite fortunate because our final years had already sat their main final exam. They sit it in January or February. So, so we had that box ticked. And so actually that initial worry about final year then translated into a worry about the next year's final year, especially as the pandemic evolved, we realised that the, the fourth years that were then going to be moving into final year were the ones that we really had to pay um, more attention to in terms of making sure, in particular, that they had access to the relevant practical classes that, that they need to obviously have access to in terms of being a, um, a competent veterinary surgeon when, when they leave the school. The final year rotations were impacted by the pandemic in, in the way that you might expect in terms of having to have reduced numbers of students on rotations and some elements of those rotations had to be taken out and delivered online. So there was elements of e-learning and hybrid learning um, running alongside the practical teaching. 
We purchased things like body cams, so we could do uh, practical sessions with students that might not necessarily be in the building. So in other words, they could be part of a case workup and they could be part of a clinical examination. We um, tried to have uh, a lot of what we call synchronous activities, so um, real real time for the students so that they could feel that connection with their, with their teachers. The graduation event for the vet school is my favourite bit in the diary. It rounds off five years of, of hard work and it's, it's incredibly uplifting, uh, it's incredibly emotional, you know, and, and um, it's a wonderful experience. I think in 2020, when we realised that there was no way we could do graduation, this was going to be a major blow. So we uh, worked with the Royal College to create an online event. Students were hugely grateful. We made staff made videos for the students and things that we played. So that was great. Um, it was hugely disappointing that we had to repeat that in the, the June of 2021. After the first lockdown um, and we, when we were able to, to um, have students back in small numbers on campus, our first priority was to schedule and timetable practical classes um, to make sure that they could catch up on anything that they'd missed, that they'd missed in the first lockdown um, and that we could just make sure that we had opportunities for students to, to practice their practical skills and also to talk to staff and re-establish the relationships that perhaps had maybe um, not been able to be fostered in the way that we might have wanted to um, during the first lockdown period. A number of colleagues moved away from what they'd been doing before on an animal-based project and turned to work with, with human SARS-CoV-2. Um, and we, so we saw an increase in grant activity, an increase in grant income overall, slightly reorientated the type of science we're doing. And uh, that mainly was with our virologists and, and, and our um, model, modelers and so forth. I think the willingness and the ability to pivot not only from an infrastructure perspective, but, but from a, a, a thinking and, a, and an approach perspective, I think stands the Institute in good stead. There's no question in my mind that that's the case. Christine Tate Barker has done wonderful stuff with, with actually isolating the virus and sharing that with, with colleagues to help their work. And, and Kenny Bailey's done stellar work looking at the genetic variation that associated with this pathogen and, and how we can use that to, to isolate, hopefully isolate drugs that will help us in the future. You know, tremendous world-breaking pieces of, of work in there, but there's many others. We will quickly forget many aspects of the lockdown and, and this pandemic, and, and it's the pieces of research that are gonna help us prepare for the next and, and combat the next one that's gonna last. And, and I see many parts of the research that's come out of the Institute and the campus that will have a, a play in that. The staff were absolutely brilliant because we just changed people's lives dramatically. It wasn't just COVID they were having to deal with, it was a completely different way of working. And everybody was incredibly responsive and nobody um, complained, everybody just took it on board. Staff um, responded uh, Fantastically. Um, once again, there was that initial sort of anxiety on, on personal level as well as um, you know, being worried about the students, but um, they really embraced the challenge. So we um, closed the buildings, so the clients were not allowed in the buildings. Um, so basically we would ring up, do the consult by phone before seeing the animal. The animal would then be brought to um, either um, to the equine hospital or to the small animal hospital. And we would go out to the car, take the animal in, do the clinical examination, and then come back um, to either hand the animal out or admit the animal. It may seem surprising, but um, we have as many visitors to our veterinary hospitals as, as visit their relatives in human hospitals. The telemedicine app worked very well, so we could show people their animals, so, you know, or send a picture once a day, or a little video. The university decided um, that a number of one-way systems would be introduced across its buildings. Literally hundreds of these signs arrived, and we had to start sort of working our way around all the buildings, putting the signs up, and it was just, it was just hard graft, it was just a group of us going around literally on your hands and knees sometimes and just throwing down, you know, keep your distance signs. There was no how-to manual, remember, it was just common sense and getting things done. As a clinical director, my biggest challenge was making sure people were safe 
while still looking after animal welfare. Every time they saw me, they would think, oh, God, here she goes again, because I would patrol the corridors um, and, and make sure we had compliance on, on um, particularly the one-way system. Um, they were brilliant at mask wearing, but occasionally they would forget that we were supposed to be going one way down a corridor, not the other way. Another sort of priority for the health and safety department was um, trying to reassure sort of different people um, that the measures we had in place um, were adequate. We also knew that we had to comply with test and protect, um, so we had to have a, a method of uh, knowing who was in which building uh, when. We have uh, tablets at uh, entrances and exits to the buildings and employees, students and visitors all sign in and out of the, um, this sign-in app. So we can use that for both fire safety and also for test and protect reasons. I think actually one of the nicest comments I received when people started coming back after the first lockdown, or certainly more people started coming back, and all the signage and the signing app had been put in place, was, you know, the buildings feel safe to work in. So when um, more people started returning to campus, um, it, was, it, it was actually harder in some ways because then that's when we had to sort of implement the one-way systems and uh, room capacity numbers. The, the major risk when people started returning back to campus was obviously we were concerned about um, an outbreak of COVID. Uh, in particular areas, especially in areas where people couldn't social distance, for example, like the, the animal hospitals, and also the, the teaching staff working with the students. So yes, a, an outbreak uh, was our main, our main concern, and we managed to avoid. <laughs> uh, during the pandemic, um, we did have to make some changes to, to how the hospital and practice works in terms of the buildings. We did change so that we had uh, one-way systems, uh, social distancing. We tried to reduce the numbers of people involved in each case. Um, but, you know, we're dealing with animals that weigh perhaps 500, 600, 700 kilos. So you have to keep yourself safe. We decided that we would uh, provide face coverings uh, for people entering clean areas, such as uh, a clinical environment or a laboratory environment. Um, the reason we made that decision is because we wanted people to, to not wear the same face covering in that environment as they would at home. I was particularly concerned that we would not be able to get hold of masks to be able to protect our staff. Um, and also I didn't want to be using masks that might have an impact on the NHS's safety. I don't want to be in competition for them to order them. So we had a lovely lady who was an equine client who ran a clothing shop in Edinburgh. And um, we got in contact with her with our requirements for the, the numbers of layers that we wanted in our masks and the type of cotton we wanted our masks to be made of. And she ran up 1,100 masks for us. And um, that's what we provided to our um, students as well as our staff when the students came back. I think the initial stages, we weren't probably so much aware of what the impact of lockdown would be. And I think that became more apparent as lockdown went on. It's very clear that you know, uh, students could become isolated and their mental health became uh, you know, challenged. And that was the same for the staff. One thing that we're all really starting to realise now is we need to have the students back with us in person as much as we possibly can um, for that sense of community, for their well-being um, and just generally for their engagement with, with the course. We're spending as much time as we can emphasising to them the importance of social interaction for their own well-being. You know, we're all now experts on Teams and Zoom and, and so forth and, and uh, um, although we still forget to unmute ourselves and we still forget the camera's not on and such like things. It was relentless. It was relentless. And, and I think many, many colleagues will recognise that their core hour just dissipated. I think for me personally, the hardest time was um, the second lockdown. Um, I had, I remember vividly talking to my third year class just before Christmas that year and saying, that's a guy's great, great job. We've got through the course. I'm sure next year everything will start to improve and we'll have more time together and, you know, we're over the worst. And then wham, there's um, another lockdown comes along. I think when you've lived and worked through such a major world event as this, inevitably, I think um, it brings people closer together. We all now know we can work in different places. We don't have to be at our desk or office desk or, or our lab. 100% of the working day to be productive. We can actually function in different parts of, 
of our community. And, and, and I think that's good. And I think we have to adapt and capture that ability. There are lots of things that I'm very proud of uh, as to how our team responded to the pandemic. You know, to an individual, nobody refused to make some contribution, whether that was come to work or cover things online um, or, or you know, continue to provide our, our service. Everybody with a smile and a, and a cheerful way continued to do what we do best. If you had asked us to innovate in the way that we did without a pandemic, we couldn't have done it. And, and that, that's the, the, I mean, we've got to take the positives out of this, that we've, we've got lots of innovation, lots of really positive things that have come out that we'll keep forever. I think the, the, the biggest message from me is, is, to be honest with you, a big thank you to all the staff and all the students. And when I say all the staff, I include that all professional services, security, servitors, the cleaners, everybody who worked really, really hard to keep the show on the road. And we did keep it on the road. Uh, it was exhausting, but I have to say, people have done an incredible job.